All right, if you would turn with me to uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, and the passage will be up here on the screen, uh, and your insert in the, in the bulletin. So chapter 13, we're going to start at verse 21 this morning. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob at Labal Hamath. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahman, Seshe, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. Then they came to the valley of Eshal, and from there they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two men, with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was, fo- was called the Valley of Eshal, because of the cluster with the sons of Israel cut off from there. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of the forty days, they went on and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they reported to him and said, We came into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the, so- by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will certainly prevail over it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, because they are too strong for us. So they brought a bad report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying, The land though which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are the people of great great stature. We we also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. God brought the Israelites to the place where they could see the promised land. After everything that we have seen in our journey through Exodus, the people only had one thing left to do, and that was to enter the land. He promised, God promised that he would fight for them. Their mission, their journey was about to be completed. But here's what they did. Moses decided to commission 12 spies, one from each tribe of Israel. And he told them to go out and search the land of Canaan and determine the nature of the land and its inhabitants. They went up and saw the land and its inhabitants. And they brought back, as we read, a cluster of grapes, some pomegranates, and figs. They even brought back a united assessment that the land was great, that it was flowing with milk and honey. But this is where there was some divide. Because the ten of the twelve said that the people there were strong in great and fortified cities, and they recognized that the descendants of Anak lived there, as well as the Amalekites, Jebusites, Amorites, Hittites, and Canaanites. Now if you think back to early on in Genesis, we get kind of that, kind of that interesting passage about the Nephilim. So if you don't remember who that group of individuals or that story, I encourage you to go back to the beginning of Genesis, and you'll learn more about uh, these specific individuals and why they would have, from a human perspective, instilled some serious fear. 
So nothing that these 12 spies do really seems too out of the ordinary. You know, if you said, hey, well, I'll give an example. Like last year when we knew we were going to come up here. We came up here and visited first to see the area. We wanted to see what was going on here and all of that. We didn't send any spies out, but we just came. But you want to get a sense of if you're going to move somewhere, you want to know where you're going. So that seems... You know, that seems to be kind of routine. But then as they're conversing back with Moses, something strange happens. So remember, they've said, you know, the land is great, but the people, eh, let's, you know, we'd be better off just to stay away from them and not fight them, even though we know God has told us he will fight our battles, even though God has repeatedly uh, done things for them um, that they didn't deserve. He provided so many miracles along the way. But Caleb, who was one of the 12 spies, he encourages Israel nonetheless to possess the land. Those 10 of the other, the 10 of the other 12 uh, encourage uh, that this not be what we do. They throw cold water at it. And they emphasize the strength of the adversaries. They even use the analogy to say they are like grasshoppers in their eyes. So what happened? My sermon in a sentence this week, and if you're not aware of this, this is my summary statement for what I'm going to speak to, and it's something that you can take with you, I hope, and share with others uh, about what we focus on this morning. And it is this. Christians and non-Christians live in the same physical reality. But by faith, Christians are given a new vantage point of hope because Jesus overcame the world. Now there's a fairly well-known story about two salesmen, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but from competing companies. And they were sent to a foreign country to assess the market for shoes. Salesman one goes to the land and scouts around for a few days. Shortly after, he heads to the telegraph office to contact company headquarters. This is what he wrote. Research complete. Unmitigated disaster. Nobody here wears shoes. Likewise, Salesman 2 does his research and heads for the same telegraph office. Once there, he composes the following. Research complete. Glorious opportunity. Nobody wears shoes. So what gives? These two men were in the same place at the same time, witnessing the same group of people, yet reported two drastically different things. Now this is not all that uncommon if we think about it because we understand and communicate based on our experiences, our perceptions, and our beliefs. In conjunction, those that listen, uh, listen through their experiences and their beliefs. It is out of our perceptions, beliefs, and experiences we build what we call a viewpoint, or what I'm calling today a vantage point. It's how we can have the same situation play out in front of two different people, but then if we ask them what happened or what was said, we get two drastically different understandings because they have two different viewpoints. Therefore, we ought not be surprised when someone who does not have Jesus as Lord in their life expresses a view different than us. I've seen that even within a body of believers that we have different viewpoints. So how much greater is that divide when Christ isn't at the center of what we do? God's desire in this place is not for us to add fuel to the fire through loud and angry arguments. 
Okay, here, we're, our job is not to go out there and, and yell back at people telling them what they're doing wrong. But rather, we are to, in love and out of mercy, recognize that what is needed is Jesus and what he is and who he is. And, and there's an understanding, a renewing of the mind that is necessary. And so first this morning, our viewpoint of who God is determines whether we place our trust in the physical realm or in the promises of God. So let's turn back to our story here from today. Not surprisingly, what we read in in Numbers 14, so this is a little bit after the passage I read this morning, but not surprisingly, Israel went the way of the ten spies who painted a picture so grim that they expressed the desire to even return to Egypt and slavery. Think about that for just a minute here. What they've witnessed, they paint the picture. And this isn't the first time this has happened. All throughout the journey, there's this pattern of, man, we had it so good in Egypt. But Caleb, along with Joshua begged Israel to reconsider, affirming the goodness of the land and that God would give that God would give to them. He promised to them, confident that if God was with them, it wouldn't matter how strong their foes were. But it was too late. The Israelites sought to stone Joshua and Caleb. Now consider Israel's perspective here for just a minute. The reality on the ground is that there's no doubt here. The ten spies recognize the land is excellent. It's got great produce. Caleb and Joshua recognize that the inhabitants are numerous, strong, and well, and living in well-fortified cities. So even those two recognize, you know, they're, they've settled in. This isn't necessarily, in a, in, in a human perspective, this isn't going to be an easy battle. Remember, the Israelites have just left slavery. They don't have the resources and strength among themselves to overcome their enemies' advantages. They assessed, so all 12 of them, including Caleb and Joshua, assess the situation as it looks on the ground. That's what we do. We look around, we see what the situation is in front of us, and we tend to make a plan based on what we see and what we hear. And so when we look at this situation in a natural light, uh, their strength against their opponents' well-dug-out, fortified cities, they see nothing but death in battle. And it might seem realistic. If, you know, if they're comparing themselves to grasshoppers, the giants that they have to face, But then we look at Caleb and Joshua one more time and say, there was something else at work here. It was their faith. They were the only ones who had a kingdom perspective. They trusted in God above all else. Now, if all that Israel could rely on was its own resources and strength, then Caleb and Joshua, I imagine, would probably have agreed with the other ten. But they remembered that God had just redeemed them from slavery, from the very Egypt which dominated Canaan and boasted the strongest empire of the day. If God could rescue them from Egypt, then God could dispossess the strong Canaanite nations before Israel. No, Israel would not trust Canaan because of their own abilities. They could only obtain it if they trusted in God. But Israel was not trusting in God. They were rebelling against him. He had promised them that he would bring them into the land, but no, they wanted to go back to Egypt, to abort God's mission halfway through. To return to Egypt would be to forsake God and everything that he had done for them. 
Again, this isn't the first time they say this, but in here we read that they even wish they would have just died in Egypt. Or in the wilderness. Lord, just let it be over with. We can see how little they trust in God or his power. And yet, how often do we do the same? We're in, when we're in a desert experience, or what we, we don't see what's coming, we, can't, we don't trust God's power, and so what we cling to is the very thing with which we found uh, normalcy. I don't even want to say comfort, because I don't know that their situation in Egypt necessarily felt real comfortable to them, but it was what they knew. So be willing to step out in faith because you have the God of the universe fighting for you. Now to this day, even in 2021, there is a place for an assessment of what's on the ground. perfect example is that we ought to always be aware of what is it that are our realities. Like today, is it wise to go outside and be in worship Given how cold it is, well, it might depend on your situation. How reliable is your vehicle? You know, what's, what's your plan if your car breaks down? There is a consensus overall about the situation of faith on the ground. However strong it may be in the past, our faith in this nation and in our world seems to be waning, even within some of our churches. Church membership and participation is declining. More and more people are declaring themselves or defining themselves as spiritual, but not religious. Strong secular forces attempt to subvert our faith and marginalize those who proclaim it. Following Jesus often may seem to be a quaint relic of the past. A historical legacy many feel is better to discard. Likewise, there is a general agreement that by our own resources and strength, it will prove nearly impossible to turn the tide on these trends. Now nobody that I've heard here has expressed it in this way, but I hear that through the prayer requests about this country. And I've heard it through other people outside of this church about they see where things are trending and uh, we wonder, we don't know, we doubt whether things may turn around. And they may, they may not. We can easily see a post-Christian secular world here just as we see across the ocean in Europe where it's been going on for a longer period of time. Realistically, if we look at things realistically, we have a reason to lament and mourn. If we have a sober assessment, the seeming futility of our endeavors uh, would be recognized. On the ground, it would seem that when we leave the building this morning, you ought to all say to me, you know, since you're the last one out the door, make sure you turn off the lights and the heat, and the electricity, and just bolt the door shut. Yet such assessments, however realistic or sober they seem to be, do not take into account the existence of God and all that he has done for us. They do not take into account that realistically, Christianity should have never existed. And even if it started, it should have died long ago. Jesus has won the victory. Jesus has overcome the world. The forces of darkness are arrayed against us, and they are strong. But nevertheless, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And secondly, faith and obedience are the highest callings for anyone who identifies as a Christian. Now, many Christians have fallen into the trap of cynicism and pessimism dressed up as being honest or realistic. 
about the problems facing the church and Christianity. Let's think about those ten spies for a minute. They were, nothing they said was dishonest. They played out the situation. They said, here's the reality. They maybe just tended to focus on emphasizing uh, the strength of the people. Which, from what I read, was true. So nothing they said was a lie. Nothing that Caleb and Joshua brought back was a lie. But what the difference was, was where their trust was placed. So we need to make sure that as we assess things, we... That, yes, we want to assess things as realistically as we can. Yes, we want to assess things honestly. But we need to assess things knowing that the God of the universe is fighting for us. Remember that these ten people who, yes, told the honest, realistic truth, resulted in the punishment of their generation for rebelling against God. They got their wish. All of them. They didn't want to go in the promised land, so God's response, okay, you won't go in the promised land. Except for you, Caleb and Joshua. You'll get to go in. The rest of the generation died in the wilderness and would not inherit the land. The ten spies died by plague. And it was not until the next generation who would place their trust in God that they would have obtained the promised land. So we remember that because the Israelites thought honesty and realism was what they were bringing, what they were dismissing was what was actually being presented. They were, they were showing off the fact that they didn't have true faith in God and that their heart in nature was rebellious. God had proven himself over and over again about about bringing them out of slavery and through all of the trials. He also, in, our, in, in a more recent day, 2,000 years ago, he proved himself again through his life, death, and resurrection. He is able to do more than you can ask or even realize. In fact, the only reason that you ever heard the gospel is because of his great power working through his servants. Have you ever thought about that that way? The only reason you heard the gospel was because someone else was being faithful and carrying out God's power and purpose in their lives. And if it was only to go based off of our resources and our strength and our ability the message wouldn't be here today. The world gives us many reasons for cynicism, despair, doubt, and pessimism. I don't know that anybody's going to disagree here with that when we look at the world. It always has and it always will. We are called as Christians to put our trust in God, recognizing that victory comes through Jesus even in the difficult circumstances. And that the ways of the world are folly to God. The decision is up to us. Are we going to live with the realistic assessment that we see in our world and to be driven by cynicism and despair as the ten spies were, proving that they had more faith in their perception and the ways of the world above their creator and redeemer? Or will we be found putting our trust in God through Christ? Aware that the odds may seem long and our mission may seem impossible. When I read the Great Commission, you know, I read it over, you know, different times and I think, man, God had a pretty impossible sounding plan to reach the entire world. How can I do anything to reach the world with this? But it's a reminder that it's God's strength and His faithfulness. That we are to put our trust and our hope in Him and His strength 
just as Caleb and Joshua did. I pray that you may, may maintain the faith and hope and not give in to the cynicism and despair in this world, but instead obtain victory in Jesus. And so we are reminded today again that as Christians, we have a different vantage point of hope through Jesus versus the world who focuses on our physical reality. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of believers like Caleb and Joshua, Lord, that looked around, assessed the fruits of walking into the promised land. They assessed the risks. And even though the risks seemed great, perhaps magnified as we often do, we tend to to be a people that long for comfort and ease rather than taking risk. Uh, Lord, I think about the salesman, that second man who saw uh, the risks were no different than the risks of the first, but yet he saw that as an opportunity uh, for a, a gain in this. And so, Lord, as we, we evaluate the things that we see in our lives, help us to be sober-minded, help us to have uh, to take an honest assessment. But Lord, uh, we pray that, that the very first thing, at the very top of our honest assessment, must come the reality and the reminder that uh, you are in charge. That those things that may seem impossible to us may be the very thing that you are calling us to. Help us to be faithful to your word, to your calling in our lives. Help us to step out of our comfort zone and be willing to stretch ourselves in ways that will glorify you and your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and our closing song. May the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people now and forevermore. Amen. And remember, church, we are sent.